you know, I always think that um, the time before you hit record is always like, I'm always like, I need to get that stuff too. Like that is, it's like the fun casual stuff. Cause it's like, once you cross the line of that record, it's like, sometimes it's like, hi, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> too formal. <laughs> Let's not be too yeah. formal about this interview. How are you today? Fabulous. How are you? I'm doing really well. I really enjoyed our chat, um, our non-podcast chat. It was nice just meeting with you and learning a Absolutely. little bit. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you're running on some, a uh, little bit of tiredness here. But we got to talk about health, I think, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> how did health come into your life in terms of how it's like um, became a profession, but also kind of like part of your lifestyle? Yeah, that's like a good question. That actually, takes me back till I was like mm, around 19. Um, I actually was about 75 pounds heavier than I am now. And uh, my brother and sister were super athletic. I had gained a lot of weight. Um, so I ended up joining a program um, that they were doing an athletic training program and lost 50 pounds doing that. And so um, that's kind of where that started for me. Mm. And as I started to have children, then my children had their own issues and my daughter's health is what really navigated me to the path that I'm on now. So what was it about her health that uh, pushed you into that? So she was born actually missing part of her immune system. And we didn't realize mm. that until she was um, almost two. She was chronically ill since birth. Within about two weeks of having her, she had um, reflux. And then we discovered MSPI. And then it was chronic respiratory infection. She had bacterial pneumonia at three months old. And so it was just like one thing after another. And medication after medication after medication. And after a while, I was just like, we can't keep doing this. This isn't this isn't working. So yeah. um Dr. Mom went down the rabbit hole <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a, a science teacher at the time. So I loved research anyways, uh, but, you know, seeking other professionals that were similar minded on holistic views, um, because the traditional route just wasn't working for her. So, and has, so this situation, did it kind of correlate into how you looked at your own health with it? Absolutely. I mean, looking at her and seeing all the things that she was dealing with, you know, missing part of her immune system, so chronically sick. Then we found out about the MTHFR. Then that opened a whole new can of worms for me. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Because that's genetic. And I used to work in a genetics lab. And that was what I really wanted to do when I was younger anyway. So um, absolutely get, change the game because you're not just eating to lose weight. You know, you're eating for a purpose and yeah. reducing inflammation and all that stuff. So it was just a whole different way of thinking. Um, especially about food. Most definitely. You say you used to work in a genetics lab. I mean, that sounds interesting to me. Like, what was that environment? And like, what was the purpose for you doing that? Yeah. So when I was 12 years old, um, I actually went to a girl's day camp. It was like a career camp and you got to pick different um, careers and go do activities with those types of things. And so the activity that we did for cytogenetics was karyotyping and I loved it. And I was like, this is what I want to do when I get older. And I went to college and then um, started the med tech program and then they wanted chemistry. And I'm like, why don't I need no chemistry to cut, you know, chromosomes apart on a slide. Yeah. So um, I just didn't align with me anymore. And I still loved it. So when I was teaching, I, you know, I went into education, started teaching and was teaching life science. So I still got my little genetics fixed yeah. a little bit, but in high school, I was able to do um, job shadowing. And so I had a semester that I went and worked with the, the med center and was able to um, then get hired on and do specimen transportation. They still had me karyotype because they knew that was my love and my passion. And um, so it's cool how that opportunity allowed me in high school to have another opportunity. And then how it's all circled back now as an adult. <laughs> what is it about the field of genetics that you like so much? I mean, is and how does that relate to how you see genetics for humans currently? You know? Yeah. So cytogenetics is... Um, for me, it was just, I really loved the, the piece of like aligning the chromosomes up and looking at them and seeing like where things could be deleted or inserted. And so when I get my labs back for my clients now, I can, I can visually see what that looks like in my brain. And um, there was a lab called the fish lab and it stood for fluorescent and cytohybridization. It was across the hall for us. And essentially what they did was they highlighted with fluorescence, different genes that had issues. Um, and so I still think about those things when I'm working with my clients, because most people don't have that experience of working in a right. genetics lab and um, they understand that I kind of get it in a different aspect than just the average person that's ordering this type of test. So, right. So you must have some thoughts about CRISPR and things like that. 
And uh, yeah, there's lots think? of different things out there. Yeah. I mean, I had my, my genome sequenced through a program called the genes for good um, through the university of Michigan, 2017. And that was fun. They did my entire genome was able to check that out. Um, I still refer back to it on occasion. I'm like, hmm, do I have this gene? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll do one research and do that. But personally, I think everybody from birth needs to have the, their entire genome sequenced because I can look on there and see pharmacologically what medications are not for me. Um, I can see and knew that I carried like the red hair gene because my son's part of his hair is like red and spotty, you know? So I know that I'm allergic to um, certain medications and on that. It says that, but how much trial and error could be avoided with medications, mm. people getting worse, if they just had their genes done in the beginning, you know, but altering yeah. them, not cool. <laughs> okay. We're going to get to that coming up here. So yeah. this is what happens. This just goes all different ways. It's just, it's just how it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts about what you just said. And then it just like, <laughs> is there a downside to knowing to having your genome sequenced from the beginning in your mind? Absolutely not. In my mind, it allows you to work preventatively. And I think that that's why it's not done. And it would uh -huh. save so much medical <laughs> stuff if that people actually knew, okay, well, these types of things aren't good for me. Or, um, you know, like we have a high risk of diabetes in our family. So this is the type of diet that I should start when I'm younger or cardiovascular health is an issue. And it's funny because I'll like do my labs with a client and I'll come back and be like, do you have a family history of like high blood pressure or heart disease? And they're like, yeah, but my doctor's not worried about it because and I'm like, but, but you're not there yet. What we want to do is prevent that. So we don't want to get to the point that your doctors worry about it. Like we want to work on it now. Yeah. So that way we can prevent that from happening. So it's really a mind frame shift for a lot of people of understanding like prevention versus correction. And so would you say, I don't want to put words in your mouth. This is a question, but like we just said, you said pre prevention may be a problem though, for some people in certain yeah. positions that this is not yes. a fruitful business prevention. Is that what you're kind of yes. saying? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. I mean, look <laughs> at the food that we have in America. Like, it's just chemically engineered junk, right? right? And so you go to Europe and how many things, thousands of chemicals from our foods are banned in Europe for a reason. They're not good for us. So if we know that red dye 40 can cause kids to have behavioral issues, but we're pumping them with it in their school lunches, hello, like, of course, there's going to be a problem there. And then if they're sensitive to chemicals, that's another problem. So having that awareness for people is expensive for the big conglomerates. <laughs> right. So I guess the yeah. question next is, is there a pathway to change the big conglomerates' minds about this and have a, a more proactive approach? Or is it too far gone? I feel like there's a grassroots movement right now where more and more people are waking up to the fact yeah. that they can do these types of things. And then it pisses them off, to be honest, that it's like an injustice. Mm. that people are just not knowing that this stuff is a problem. And then once they're aware, then they get upset and they're like, why is this the way that it is? And if there's enough pushback over a period of time, it could potentially cause yeah. a change. But in reality, how many thousands of doctors are trained in one way to keep just pushing that medication, right? And so they don't know any difference. So trying to change their mind is a, a whole conundrum. And they're essentially the ones out there marketing for the drug companies. So- I mean, that this is a big rabbit hole conversation. I mean, oh yeah, honestly, yeah. right. I mean, everyone knows. <laughs> you no, know, if you yeah. look at like, actually, I just had a sports pharmacist on uh, on my last episode, and like, it's just kind of funny that this is happening. We're talking about this. Yeah, and we yeah. talked about different shows like Dope Sick and Painkillers and all these different things about pharmaceutical companies, but there is kind of a movement. I feel like that we forget that people control things. I think we we mm -hmm. forget that we have agency as humans. Yeah. We yeah. just, we always give away that agency. I always feel like yeah. in a sense, I'll tell agree. you a good example of this. I lived in a place about four months ago where a lot of the children have phones and they spend a lot of time with their head down, friends and stuff. I'm now in a place in Colorado here where almost no kids have phones, same age, and they play like kids used to. What's the mm -hmm. difference there? Like the yeah. people here have, have taken their power and said, you know what, we've we've heard enough information that this isn't good. So yeah. we're all going to band together and we're going to take our power back. And I think that's maybe what you're saying is more people are having they're waking up to like, wait a minute, these people don't control us. We, we're mm -hmm. the consumer. Why aren't we having the power here? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And the thing is too, is a lot of doctors, when you start to do that, will also push back on you. Like you don't know what you're talking about, mm. but when you're the one that's done the time and the research on those yeah. things and the doctor hasn't, and they've had maybe this much training on something. I mean, nutrition is the key thing in med yeah. school. Doctors get like a day of yes. nutrition when <laughs> nutrition is like the, right. Crazy. Nutrition is the foundation for everything. Right. So, you know, food is the medicine or it's poison. You got to pick. And a lot of times here in the States, especially it's poison because we eat for survival in the aspect of like just eating, but not with intention and purpose of healthy survival and desired outcome, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. And a lot of people are eating for entertainment as like a recreational yeah. activity. Mm-hmm. And it was even more wild with doctors is the crazy residency period they have. And this complete and total lack of respect for sleep um, and exercise. It's like, but this also is kind of a socialized thing of how uh, people many, many years ago, the doctor can do no wrong. The doctor Mm -hmm. says it, this must be what it is. And now people are like, it's not that you don't have expertise or you're not intelligent, just that you didn't cover all of these things. So how can you know about this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, things science is changing all the time, right? So you graduate 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, like change has been made and developments and yeah. research and studies since that time. And no doctor's going to keep with that on a regular basis. I mean, let's be honest. And then the other thing that I see as an issue is we have these specialists in one area, but they don't look at the body as a whole thing. Yeah. So it's like, you got, you know, your cardiovascular doctor, your endocrinology doctor, you got all these things and they specialize in that, which doesn't mean they don't know their stuff, sure. but they don't understand that that's tied into everything else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it didn't seem so obvious, it's like an isolated it? incident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting thing. I had a friend um, several years ago and she was low in vitamin D and went to her endocrinologist. They give her a D2 prescription. Mm-hmm. And she went back and her levels were still low. And I said, friend, why are, why are you taking D2 and not D3 with K2? And she was like, I don't know. That's just what the doctor told me. I was like, do that instead. Now this is before, like this, just yeah. me being a teacher and a friend, you know, right. Sure. Um, years ago before I did any of my certification and she did that for a month, went back. The doctor was like, oh my gosh, your levels are normal. This is great. What did you do yeah. different? And she said, I took a different form. <laughs> yeah. My friend told me to take this one. So it's like, you're a trained endocrinologist and giving the wrong information. That's a little bit frightening. <laughs> it is a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it just speaks to that. You know, we need a lot of different outlets of information and, and we need to yeah. be okay with saying, this is not my scope of practice. Yep. And I, can, I am not the best person to help you with this, but then yep. that gets in the way of ego mm-hmm. of people, because if you are at a certain status yeah. level, in many ways you believe that you're more, informed than you are for that Mm -hmm. because of your status and power and the position you're in, you know? Right. And we have the ability to access, you know, research journals and do all that stuff nowadays. So it's like, you can do your own research. And when I work with my clients, I don't give them the science of all the things because people don't really care how things work. Like you don't care the carrot Krebs cycle and how you're getting energy from ATP. Like nobody cares. They just want to know that they're going to feel better and they can trust you that you know what you're talking about. So I'm like, there's enough people out there that are you know, giving that information if you really want to get nerdy and I'm nerdy too. And I like that type of stuff, but I'm going to filter that for you. And we're just going to work on fixing this situation as opposed to like continuing to dull your brain. <laughs> this, this is the problem with a lot of people in fitness and wellness, especially in my business is we think that the way to change people's minds, to give them all this factual information and these yeah. white papers and to say, let's talk about the electron transport system. Let's talk about that. This, If this many people did this amount of exercise, X amount of people would not die during the year. As right. a singular human being, you often don't care about other people's uh, life vitality and whether yeah. this <laughs> amount of people live or die. I, this sounds very cruel what I'm saying. I'm just, just human condition. Yeah. You often yeah. don't think outside of yourself. You yep. can even yeah. take it even further. You can't even Mm -hmm. think of yourself in the future. That person doesn't exist to you. So why would you care about other people's health and wellness? You have to bring a different approach. Well, and the other thing too, is a lot of times you'll go to the doctor, let's say you're overweight or you've gained a lot of weight and they'll be like, just lose weight, but they won't give you the steps of what that looks like or how to do that. Or, you know, any nutritional based things. And they refer you out. And a lot of times, you know, my sister's a perfect example 
she has PCOS, so her weight is an issue and has been an issue. Her periods irregular, like massively irregular. Right. And so like working with her and I can, you know, work to get things going, but she's like, oh, I met with a dietitian in college and they had me do this. And, you know, it didn't really work for me. And, you know, now she's like, I can feel my body's changing. My clothes are fitting different. And I'm like, yeah, because we're focusing on the actual roots, not just like, hey, let's just eat these certain foods on a plate because that sounds good, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What is it? I actually got into a conversation with a client about this. I'm curious about your take on this. What is it about nutrition that is such a lightning rod and so controversial, maybe more than other things like exercise or community, social, the importance of social health for people? Talk to me about that a little bit. It's an emotional thing. We have become so emotional around food, all of our events around food, right? We have different holiday traditions that involve food and, you know, we got to have grandma's sweet rolls or whatever it is for Thanksgiving. And we eat because those things evoke an emotion in us. And so a lot of people, when they're changing their diet, they literally have to change their thinking of how and what food is and what that means to them and the relationship with food. And that was something when I was losing my weight, like I had no idea that I like a portion of chicken was the size of my hand. I thought it was a whole dang chicken breast. Like I had no idea. And so there's really no education on food either, except for the old, you know, archaic food pyramid or now the plate, but what food does to our body and the impact it has on us. So when I tell people like, listen, you need to get, you know, rid of the inflammatory foods. We need to look at getting rid of omega sixes and cooking with different oils. And we need to get rid of like dairy and gluten because those are highly inflammatory. Oh, that's a trend. That's a fad. And it's not, (laughs) it's proven. And so really taking those people through a mental process of like, what's the deal with food? Does, is it something that you rely on to, you know, when you're bored, you go open the freezer or fridge and go find some chips to snack on. Um, is it a sensory thing? Like really finding out their relationship the with relationship. food. And I think that's yes. why it is such a, a lightning rod, as you said. The relationship with food is such a big point when working with people is is like, hey, let's let's uh, let's approach this from the the symptomology here and really look as like, how do you view food in your mind? These are different approaches than like, what are you eating? Isn't that like right. let's look at the relationship? The other thing I wanted to say too was interesting is that what happens when food becomes your identity? Mm. And so this is one of the other things I also think separates from exercise and other things is often people with food or diet create an identity through that diet. I'm a vegan. I'm into paleo. I am a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. Then it doesn't even become about the food. It becomes, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. First, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, identifying yourself as anything is always its own little conundrum, right? But I think a lot of times we do that in a way so people understand um, maybe not necessarily your choices, but your lifestyle. Because diet, the word diet gets thrown around loosely and erratically. (laughs) And people think that a diet is something that you like do for a short period of time, right? And it's like, oh, I can do this. I'm going to hit my goal. I'm going to lose weight. Then I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing. No. Diet is a daily commitment and a lifestyle, a choice of how you're choosing to, you know, fuel your body. And so me as somebody that's been dairy and gluten-free for like 10 years, I am dairy and gluten-free. People know that, that like, yeah. that's not a thing, but I'm not going to sit there and be like, you know, sir, my whole identity, but people respect me and my choices because they know that that's part of my lifestyle. Yeah. Just like, you know, somebody saying that they're a specific religion or whatever, sure. that's how they're yeah. building connections and community but it can get to be too much for some people. And that's the, you know, strict, like, yeah, oh, I'm this and I'm that. And then they go from one extreme to another. So some people go from like, oh, I was vegan for five years <laughs> and then now I'm all carnivore, you know, <laughs> but they're like, I feel so much better with carnivore. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, because your body is different. So, <laughs> you know, being able to explore those things and not staying so rigid with those labels is, I feel like, important too. Yeah, that's interesting, the rigidity. I, and also it's interesting what happens when the identification crosses a line where it starts to destroy your social fabric of your life, where it's so rigid that, I mean, I really can't go out with you now because I don't know if you're going to be able to have the things that I need or in the groups and gatherings starts deteriorating into an isolation 
sometimes. Yeah. And thankfully for like our friends, because my kids have had food sensitivities and all that sure, stuff, like yeah. we've been through all of that. And we have surrounded ourselves with people who understand those things and, you know, no dye, no gluten, all that stuff. And our friends are like, Hey, we'll, we'll bring some extra like things that sure. we can, we know the kids can eat, or they'll ask, Hey, can they have this, this, or this? We want to make yeah. sure that they feel included and we prepare if not. And so I think that that's food is so emotional because it does make you feel excluded when you can't participate in those social gatherings and social events, you know, 4th of July potlucks, whatever. Right. Um, and so generally you eat beforehand and people are like, oh, there's food. And you're like, I already ate. And it's just right. like a whole thing, <laughs> right? But if you can surround yourself with people that understand yeah. why you do the, the things that you do and love you enough to invite you to those situations and still be able to allow you to show up and them, you know, make it not awkward for you to be included yeah. um, because they understand that that's something that can make you feel excluded, not intentionally, sure. but that's just yeah. the societal things, you know, here's yeah. a bunch of junk food. Let's put it on the table and snark down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And then there's, yeah. see, this is the, the interesting nature of food. Then you could take it a step further. Then there's the ethnic aspect of food and mm -hmm. the cultural component, right? And how yes. that often brings people together and their own culture, yeah. all right? And how mm -hmm. if you infiltrate that and you try to like just blow that up, you're not just blowing up the food, you're blowing up the culture as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you like refuse to eat, that's another thing too, right? right? Depending on the, the group that you're in or right. whatnot, that's, that's a hundred percent too, because then they take offense to that. And <laughs> right. That's a possibility. They could be like, well, why aren't you eating? Is my food not good yeah. enough for you? No, I, like it's yeah. a lifestyle yeah. preference or whatever, you know? Sure. So that's where that surrounding yourself with community that understands is super duper important yeah. too, for sure. And I think the word you said, understand, is the most important mm -hmm. part. It doesn't always mean yeah. that, that everybody's doing the same thing you're doing. They just understand right. that this is part of your lifestyle. And so we we have some extra things available and stuff like that, more inclusivity yep. versus yep. like, I only surround myself with vegans. <laughs> it's like, yes. you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I mean, I'll go to, a you know, find a good vegan spot because it's dairy free and I'll have to worry about it, you know, right. most of the time with the gluten issue. But I'm not going to sit here and identify myself as I'm a vegan. It's like, no, I'm just dairy gluten free. Like right. <laughs> that's yeah. my lifestyle and soy, you know? So, yeah. Interesting stuff. So where do you think we're headed then with all this information, everything we've talked about, where are we headed in terms of our holistic idea of health and wellness? Kind of as you see it, kind of how things are moving in your mind. You know, more and more people are trying to navigate after years, it usually takes around seven practitioners for people to find answers before they generally kind of go the natural route. And it's like, this isn't working for me anymore. Um, and I think that while that's great that they finally are kind of moving in the natural direction, there's still natural and functional practitioners that don't look at food. And that is disheartening and frustrating to me because that's the foundation of holistic life, like lifestyle pillars, like support. Um, so I have a client that has been working with her functional practitioner for a while. Um, and I was really frustrated with the fact. So this client is like, you know, in her, in her sixties and she has had, um, algamam fillings since she was like 17 mm -hmm. and her functional practitioner said, Oh, just leave them in because all the mercury by now is leached out. And I was just like, no, we need to get those out of there or you're never going to be able to detox because she's constantly so I'm like, how is a functional practitioner telling you this? So about, since working with me, she's got those out. Like we're starting to work on other things, but I was just so flabbergasted. And then I have other people be like, yeah, I've been working with a functional practitioner. I worked with them for nine months and I didn't see any results. And then I came to you and in like 30 days, I was already on track and like making progress. And I'm like, food, it's just food. Like <laughs> yeah. we just got to shift that. So even if somebody's a functional practitioner, if they're not looking at nutrition or at least recommending someone to go like work with them for nutrition on a holistic way, not like a registered dietitian, cause that's a completely different, you know, yeah. jungle to navigate. Um, but another functional practitioner that can work with them with food, then it's like, why, why are you working with them? Because that's ultimately going to be where the root is is the inflammation that's stemming from your food choices. It was interesting. There's just so many different practitioners on so many different levels out there. Yeah. For the consumer, how can they best, how can they find someone that is going to fit their needs best? Like what are the things to look for 
Um, obviously, you said talking about food, but like on a large scale level, just a general level, what are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, you want to find somebody that aligns with what you're what you're trying to do, aligns with you as a person. Like, I love my clients because, I mean, I'm pretty unfiltered. <laughs> yeah. I'll drop f bombs in the middle of my sessions. Yeah, that's, and that's just who I am, you know. <laughs> but I'm not going to get somebody that's crazy conservative because that doesn't align with me. I want to mm. make sure that the clients I'm working with are like like me, right? Like I want to be able to have fun. I want to be able to enjoy meeting with them and laughing and having a good time while we're on there because there are those moments that are pretty intense and heavily dense emotionally. And I want to be able to balance that, right? And make sure that they feel heard and seen and valued. Um, but finding somebody that you can connect with, not just on a like professional level, but I feel like also on a like individual level yeah. is important as well. And, um, you know, letting them know, like, this is what I'm looking for and interviewing them if you need to. Like I get on a call, I won't accept a new client until I sit down with them at least 15 minutes yep. and then go, okay, well, this is the next steps. Here's like, let's get on a call for 30 minutes. Let's kind of create a grand print and then we'll go from there, get your options and you can decide. I'm not just going to be like selling you a product. I, I'm here individually to support each person. So I get up people all the time that are asking me like, well, how much does it cost to work with you? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you have going on? Let's hop on a call and see, yeah. and we can create a custom program for you. Right. So I have no general pricing structure because everybody's in a different spot. Some people may, th may need 30 days. Some people may need 90 day meal plan. Like it's just so individualized, but I'm not one of those people that's just be like, this is what you need to do. Everybody needs to do this. You know, it's yeah. yeah there's some things that are like foundational, but the rest of it is individualized. And so finding someone that aligns with you, not only personally, professionally, but also with your health and wellness goals and working with that moving forward. So keeping in line with that, what are some questions a consumer should ask someone they're interviewing to work with them in this capacity? Um, you know, I don't have anybody that's like necessarily interviews me because I'm the one doing the interviewing most of the time to see if I want to work with them. But um, watching their content on social media, if you feel like you can connect with somebody and resonate with them, I feel like that's a good indicator, not just necessarily by how they um, approach things, like how, what they're saying, but their tone, the, the vibe you get through the screen, like all that stuff really mm. matters because you can tell if you tune in how people are through that screen, right? Like the first time you and I met, I was like, yeah, this is fun. This, this is such a time. great point. We got to expand on this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things, you know, and you can tell if somebody's really dry personality and that's not going <laughs> to jive with you. Don't do it next. <laughs> you know, um, so I don't, I don't really go for the question piece. I go for the energetic piece. Yeah. I was just curious because, um, I mean, I don't, I don't mind when people ask me questions. I want people to be curious about me and ask right. me questions. But um, yeah. putting that aside, I, I want to focus on what you said about kind of the tone and the feeling. I don't think mm -hmm. we talk about this enough. We talk yeah. about the content, okay, what they're mm -hmm. saying. But we don't talk about how they make us feel for that. Yeah. This is, you're, you're one of the only people I've heard say this. And I think this <laughs> needs to be repeated <laughs> for yeah. that. What, how are they conducting themselves? Are, do they seem like they're interesting? Is it going, because mm -hmm. you have to have a good time too in the relationship. It right. can't be a one way. I'm, I'm a big proponent of this. When I work with people like, this has got to be good for me too. Yep. <laughs> like they yep. can't be like, uh, you're having a great time. I'm not, you know, yes. <laughs> like, it works yep. both ways, you know, a hundred percent agree. Yeah. And uh, yep. it's interesting. I wonder how do you feel? How do you know you're getting the real person? from what they're saying and you know because we, what if it's a show for for right. online well and i think that that's where that 15 minute console kind of plays yeah. a factor because people get to come meet me i get to ask them questions and they get to kind of fill me out at the same point you know um and at the end i ask them like if you feel like this is mutually beneficial we can move to the next thing if not it doesn't align here's some resources have yeah. a nice day um but most people don't tap into their energy enough to see where they sit and how they're feeling. Yeah. And I think since the pandemic for me, that's been a big thing that I've really worked on is how I'm feeling and how my nervous system feels when I'm engaging with other people. Mm -hmm. And if my nervous system feels off, it's a hell no, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and sometimes those things slip by and it was like, Oh, that should definitely have been a hell no, but I kind of let that. So yeah. there are lessons that go with that. Um, but if somebody is putting on a show, you can generally feel it when you get on a call with them. Yeah. 
I agree then they that. kind of show who they really are. Yeah. And um, for me, I, in the last few years, I have really started strive to be as authentic as I can be online. And that means showing up and dropping F-bombs, even in my content, because I want people to see me authentically. And I think people crave authenticity, but they're too scared to be authentic themselves. Yeah. And so while they want that, they also simultaneously push it away because they don't feel confident enough to be who they are at the core. And um, that's, I want to, by being authentically me, I want to make sure that other people can feel like they can show up authentically themselves too and laugh and have a good time. And that's where I feel like that connection comes in with working with clients is because they can relax and they can let their guard down too, because they have had so many other practitioners, for example, that have gaslit them or yeah. you know, other people in their lives and situations and traumas and medical trauma is a huge issue, you know, yeah. dealing with people with, with health issues. And so having them be aware that my space is a safe space and that's why I'm there to support them in that process. Um, they can generally feel that Yeah. when I'm working with them. This is such an important part of this whole conversation. I really, you know, there's obviously lots of parts of health and wellness are really important, but in like the humanity and other people and seeing that I totally, this yeah. is one of the things I love about podcasts and especially longer podcasts. If yeah. you, like a practitioner and you listen to them on the podcast, they can only be fake for so long. Yeah. If you're going to hear someone talk for a long time, that veil is going to come undone, especially if the host is really good at pulling it out of them. And the yeah. you, you, you can start seeing a pattern in how they conduct themselves. And I think yeah. that's really important to, I always tell people like, you want to work with me? Just listen to my podcast. You're going to yeah. know me a lot better by hearing me talk to other people the questions yeah. I ask, the inquisitiveness, how I laugh, how I come across. I'd much rather you do that, listen to me talk for a while, than get 10 seconds from me in a soundbite. Yeah. You don't know me from that. You'll never get a good yeah. idea about me from that. Yep. And that's why like on my, all my stuff, I'm always like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach you the processes of how these body parts and things work. Like, I'm yeah. not going to sit here and be like, this is the whole thing of methylation. Blah, blah, blah. Sure. I'm not going to do that. There's enough other people out there that'll do that. I want to work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and we figure things out together, not sit here and teach you stuff that I could be teaching seventh graders, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you really don't care, to be honest. Most yeah. people just don't care. They just want to know that you care enough to actually help them. So another great point, I think, which goes over the head of a lot of providers, service care providers in any field. It's mm -hmm. people want to, they want to be seen. They want to know that you're actually yep. a kind, caring person. You're into them. And then yep. the information is more receptive over time. Yeah. But it's kind of like uh, on LinkedIn, I would say is with people or anything, but I experience this with LinkedIn is when people will reach out to me and it's always a sales pitch right off the bat. Yeah. Yep. I'm like, first of all, who does this work for? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying no one, to say, zero. <laughs> like, how many times has this actually worked for you saying yeah. this? And then I've so, actually like, asked people that. Like, what did they say? Is, well, I'm like, because I used to be in network marketing. And so I have that experience with <laughs> you know coaching people, right? <laughs> yeah. I know it. Like, I know. And I'm like, that you're doing it all wrong. So a lot of times they'll be like, so how's that working for you? Have you gotten much response? No, I haven't. I'm like, well, kudos to you for making the effort. Yeah. Are you open to some advice on how to, you know, improve your skill set or whatever? And so, you know, I've had people buy my books and things like that. And I'm yeah. like, go read that. You'll, you'll get some good information from those. <laughs> but yeah, some people take super offense and I'm like, you know, I'm not trying to critique you and be a complete ass about it. Like I just yeah. like you're trying and I can see that you're making the effort. You just need a little bit more training. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's all. You're definitely you're trying, but I know you're just going around and doing this with everyone. Yeah. yeah. And it's just yeah, like, you don't know any different. Right. That's what they know. Yeah. They've been taught, whatever. But yeah. it's like I'm always like, how does this even work? Like, yeah, who is like it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Sign me up for that. <laughs> I've never met you my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I think around 2012, when Facebook was like new, that was a thing. Yeah. But people have forgotten that it's not 2012 anymore. <laughs> and we can actually talk on the internet like regular humans. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Most definitely. It's like, okay. Yeah. Mm. And I think it's, they're just missing this, this large connection piece. It's mm -hmm. like, I had a guy contact me today. This is so funny. We're saying this and he goes, <laughs> Oh, do, do you, uh, do you use this for lead generation and stuff? I was like, no, not really. I just like connecting with people and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I could tell it like threw him off. 
Like, you know, yeah. he wasn't used to that. It was like, hey, watch this video. Mm-hmm. Hey, do you know, I, I help with people who do what you do. It's always the same yeah. thing. I help yep. people scale up their business. Same. Yep. Yada, yada. You know, you've, it's yep. like, man, what school does everybody go to? <laughs> right. Yes. It's the same, same pitch line. It's like, man, mm-hmm. is there like a place that people learn this? <laughs> there must be, but it's antiquated. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 So it, it's just interesting. Like the caring piece has to feel authentic. It yeah. just has to. And I think all service providers, like you, you have to exude that. Mm-hmm. You well, you have care, to have a level of, exactly. If you don't care, nobody's going to care either. They'll be like, oh, I'll just find somebody else. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately people have spent so much money with the people that don't care, but the promise that mm. they're going to feel better because they have fallen into that trap of like, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. Cause they have these credentials instead yeah. of looking at them as a person and going like, oh, I feel like this person might be able to help me and I align with their message and their, their, who they are and what they stand for. Like in the past, I've left companies making six figures because I didn't align with the values oh, yeah. and integrity anymore. And I was like, you know what? That sucks to walk away from a really nice paycheck, sure. but that doesn't align with who I am. And I can't represent a brand or a company that's not going to honor the same values that I do as a person. And people respect me for that because they knew that wasn't an easy choice to make. Yeah. And that I will make that choice because I value the my people, my customers, my clients, who I'm working with, my teams, because I have more integrity than that. <laughs> so yeah. I can't be, I can't be bought. <laughs> you know what's funny you say that? I feel like I've heard that story more than I've ever heard my entire life. And Sad. that is also, I think, a, a, an increasing societal change where the worker is like, mm-hmm. you know what? You don't own me. You no yep. longer, because you're giving me this money that you won't walk away. I feel like the workers are more like, I will walk away from this. Mm-hmm. I actually really love that. I think it's, again, well, you have power. Don't give it yes. away. You know. Yes. And I think the thing is most people are waking up to realize that not only do they have the power, but they have the freedom of choice on how they want to live their life, especially after yeah. COVID, right? Like we all saw the shift that it's not that people don't want to work. People just don't want to work for crappy pay, crappy yes. relationships, crappy, all of that stuff. You know, like they actually want to be able to enjoy what they're doing, have a sense of purpose, not just collect a paycheck that's meaningless and spend time with their kids, maybe two or three hours a week. Like yeah. they actually want to live their life a little bit more and what have a, novel a different approach. <laughs> I know. Right. Like two parents working, we definitely need to have more time as a family, not, you know, one person at home. Those that can do that nowadays with the cost of living, right? It's impressive, right? But not yeah. everybody can, you know. And so that that big piece, I think, nobody's taught how what how and what healthy relationships look like, yeah. and whether that be in the workplace, whether that be you know friendships or relationships in like a romantic sense, relationships with your children. Yeah. And I think a lot of this this time, people are waking up to realize like, oh, well, that's not a healthy thing. Let me let me do some work on that. And people are doing the work. And those that aren't doing the work, they're, they're staying where they're at. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Tell. They're staying where they're at. And and yep. another thing, you're just you're hitting on a lot of important things. Like there's this misconception that people don't want to work. I don't believe that. The people, yep. everybody no, I, I know either. wants to work. They just don't want to mm-hmm. be filled like feel like they're being just basically held down and yep. imprisoned by their job. And right. that is a positive movement in society to say, I just want to have a better life like can you just yeah i want a better life like it seems yeah. so obvious yeah. but for the longest times humans have accepted a worse life because mm-hmm. oh well you know this company has the power and what if i don't make this money and stuff and people are like well you know what yeah. why am i thinking like this you know yeah well yeah and the, the fair pay i mean is an important piece because we yeah. all have to survive And then we wonder why kids are, you know, getting in more and more trouble and having things happen. Well, their parents can't be there because they're struggling to make ends meet, Right. you know, trying to survive because the cost of living has increased so much, especially in the last three, four years. So it's an interesting uh, societal conundrum. I mean, you see it. And I was just talking to my wife about this yesterday. I said, you're seeing more and more workers striking, Mm -hmm. saying we, we need better pay. We need, we just, and it's thing is like, when you, when you listen to this, it's not like they're striking for like this incredible thing. 
it's mm-hmm. like, can I get a little more time to like yeah. actually be a person? <laughs> you know, yeah. can we like get a little more money so I can enjoy a little bit of my life? It's usually yeah. not this incredible thing that people are mm-hmm. wanting. It's like, can you just be fair? <laughs> right. Know? And that's, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on the mouse house over here because I live next to it. <laughs> right. I mean, they they definitely, they're striking a lot. And for as much money as they bring in, the workers just don't make much living in their right. cars and low yeah. income. And I'm like, and those people make the magic. Like <laughs> they are the magic them, makers. <laughs> there's none. Yeah. So it's like, pay them, give them some magic, like <laughs> love them back, you know, give a little bit. Magic. <laughs> give so some it's magic. an interesting thing. Yeah. It is an interesting thing. I it's, um, I, and I think more people are just railing against that. They're like, listen, there's a huge difference between someone who's, making hundreds of millions of dollars and they lose 10 million. I mean, it's like losing pocket change. And I, right. When someone's making, you know, 50, 60 grand a year and they lose 10, 15 grand, they, that changes their life dramatically. Yep. Right. It's Definitely. like, you, you got to remember these people, everybody is in a different existence like here and yep. the engine is the people take care right. of the people. <laughs> you know. Like, yeah. And everyone's perception is, everyone's perception is their reality. Yeah. So if somebody's stuck in this, like, oh my gosh, I'm in this hypervigilant state, let's talk about how that works. Like their healing's not going to work either, even if they're trying, right. because they're so stressed out by all these other conditions, their nervous system is out of whack. And so they could do all the right things and do the yoga and the meditation right. and the go toxin free and get the <laughs> sleep and all that and eat good. But if their nervous system's still in fight or flight, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Like, yeah. But that comes from that work life balance and being able to do those things. So all yeah. ties together. It does all tie together. Man, I, I knew this was going to be good. I knew this was going <laughs> to be good. I could tell when we chatted yeah, before, just, uh, you know, in this, and then looking at health, there's so many pathways and different things to discuss. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good endpoint of what you just said. We can do all these things. But what if this one thing is completely off? We're always yep. in, we're always up. And we're always, yeah, like, hey, and- I don't know whether how today is going to go for me. I'm yeah. so worked up about my job and I don't know. Am, am I going to be able to afford these things? Like everything else yeah. is off the table. If, if you're yeah. just always in that feeling, you know? Yeah. Well, and you got to think about it too, is like the cogs of a wheel, so to speak, right? Like yeah. if you have a bicycle tire and one of those spokes breaks spoke, out, yep. your tire is going to go flat. Right. And so that's the same way you got to think about it with your whole lifestyle and everything work family, you know, relationships, and that includes friends. And I think a lot of people too, um, kind of get in the situation, especially as a mom, like it's mom life, right? We're in the thick of it and we don't have those external relationships. And then our marriages and those interpersonal relationships get stressed because we're putting all that expectation on our spouse. And instead of being able to have a friendship that go vent to, and, you know, or a sibling, you know, like all of those things, those, those relationships and the variety of relationships get cut off because we're so tired yeah. from doing all of these things. And especially as moms, we're coordinating play dates and after school activities yeah, and, you know, yeah. all these things. It's like, where do I even fit in, in my own life yeah. anymore? Yeah. And so that awareness I think is important too, for, for moms to have, because it's easy to lose ourselves. And we're the ones as women that mostly are struggling with a lot of health irregularities yeah. because we're so stressed out trying to balance everything. Yeah. Just on point in so many different ways here. Rhiannon, it's been a pleasure. Seriously. Um, Absolutely. You're, you're very succinct. You're to the point. You you get it going. I love that. You're just very pleasant. Please tell uh, everyone how they can just get more of you in their lives yeah. and learn more about you. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. It's been a pleasure to be here. So you can find me on TikTok at MTHFR underscore coach, also on Instagram, or you can email me for questions at MTHFR coach at revitalizing hyphen wellness.com. Perfect. There it is, everyone. Thank you, Rihanna. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thanks for being here.